Versailles, The Immortal, épisode 4, 1924-2023. In the aftermath of World War I, a citizen of the United States, John D. Rockefeller Jr., donated generously to the effort to restore the palace and park of Versailles, the Trianon palaces and their gardens. Nicely put. Oh, hello there. Sorry, I thought I was alone. How have you been since the last episode? Stopping in 1923 rather left you on tender hooks, I'd imagine, knowing what's coming down the line. Since you're passionate about the history of Versailles, the plaque I'm currently looking at should interest you. It's located not far from the Gallery of the History of the Palace, our usual meeting place, on the wall of the entrance, practically opposite the chapel. I really like this plaque, as it whisks me away on a journey. The United States of America, Rockefeller Jr., it's like the sound of adventure for someone who was born and died in Versailles. In the case of the palace, though, this American saved it from the sound of the rain seeping in and the walls collapsing. Through his donations in 1924 and 1927, he contributed more than 30 million francs towards the restoration of the estate. And boy, did we need it! While I'd love to talk to you only about works of art, grand ideas, and royal romances, a palace like Versailles needs way, way more than that to sustain it. Meaning we can't avoid talking about Écu, Louis, and Sou, or their modern-day equivalents, francs, dollars, and euros. The funny thing is that the donations from this generous benefactor actually prompted the French government to provide more support to the Palace of Versailles it seems it stirred the patriotic pride of certain people. And so, it became a building site once more. I told you, it never stops the work on this place, but I love it. We remove, we refill, we replace, we restore, until finally, it feels like we've miraculously returned to how things were before. As if time had left no mark. The architect in chief, Patrice Bonnet, was in charge of the works, though the curators, André Perraté, Gaston Brière, and then Pierre Ladoué, played a major part too. The renovations continued throughout the 1920s and 30s, during which the estate remained open to visitors. Outside its walls, however, the world was in turmoil, and the future looked bleak. Between the two world wars, Monsieur Bonnet even suggested the construction of a shelter beneath the marble courtyard in case of an aerial attack. But we remained focused on regilding moldings and organizing exhibitions. In the spring of 1939, Crowds flocked to the palace to visit the exhibition on 150 years of the revolution and life in Versailles in 1789. But the celebration didn't last long, as at the end of August, Versailles, like all other historical monuments, closed its doors to the public, and they were to remain shut for many years. Where should I put these bricks, sir? Put them at the back of the gallery, but be careful of the wainscoting, which has been taken down and stored on the side. Are we going to build walls in the Hall of Mirrors? We're going to brick up the two entrances, yes, and then the windows as well. Block up the windows? But then you won't be able to see anything. Wakey, wakey, lad, there's a war on. What do you think would happen to Louis XIV's mirrors if they were to be hit by shrapnel, huh? Calm down, John. There are loads of sandbags in the courtyard. Uh, shall I bring them in also? No, the bags are for outside. We're going to build a shelter in the cave in the Apollo's Baths Grove. A shelter for Apollo? A shelter for us, in case of bombardment. Do you think they dare bomb Versailles? You think they wouldn't, huh? They haven't forgotten what was signed here 20 years ago, you know? Is everything all right, Simono? We're on schedule, Monsieur Bonnet. 
Is there much left to do on the other floors? No. The last works were removed from the palace in early October. They've gone to Chambord, right? Yes. And the Chateau de Brissac, mostly. It's the wainscoting I'm worried about. The minister requested that I stop taking it down, and I'm exhausted replying to all these people who are complaining that the palace is empty and closed up. Best case scenario is that we're being too careful. But the worst case... Exactly. I'd never forgive myself in that case. Well, let's hope the winter isn't too harsh, because with no heating... And that winter was harsh, let me tell you, as were all the others that followed. After the museum closed in August 1939, France declared war on Germany on September 3rd. Some of the palace staff were mobilized to the front. Inside, the atmosphere was very strange, with all the empty rooms, walls stripped bare, and it was so cold. On June 14, 1940, a day I will remember for the rest of my ghostly existence, the German army, the Wehrmacht, entered Versailles. I can still see those tanks rolling down the Avenue de Paris and parking haphazardly on the Place d'Armes. The next day, June 15, Victorien Sissac, one of the few guards left at the palace, was ordered to take the German soldiers up to the roof so they could hoist the swastika flag. I have retained vague memories of these years. Visits by Hermann Göring, German soldiers taking photos in front of empty fountains and touring the royal apartments with a guide printed specially for them. Philippe Pétain even considered relocating his government to Versailles, but this was initially refused by the occupiers. Pretty lucky when you think about it. From 1941, the Germans pushed for the estate to be reopened. So windows were unblocked, artworks were reinstalled, and the public was admitted once more. But for me, there was no soul anymore. When I soared over the estate, all I saw was unkempt grass taking over the walkways and on the banks of the Grand Canal, I even saw sheep being used to keep the grass down. In the palace, the glass roofs and ceilings were collapsing as a result of the freeze and thaw. I also remember the tanks in the Great Park, the fear and the hunger. From London, the latest news. Numerous airborne troops have descended behind the German lines. In the summer of 1944, as the Allied forces reached the city gates, we all held our breaths for fear that the Germans might destroy what they were about to lose. But on August 25th, after more than 1,500 days of occupation, the Leclerc division entered Versailles and Victorien Sessac once more climbed up the roof, this time to hoist the French tricolor. Versailles had survived intact. Damaged, but intact. Once again, the palace had weathered the storm of history. Do you hear the joy? That's the sound of a spring Sunday in the early 1950s. The sound of spring returning after so many long years of winter. Another renaissance, of which Versailles has experienced so many. And more works, as ever, to repair the damage caused by neglect. But in the rooms and along the walkways, I feel like the palace is attracting a new type of visitor. After the courtiers, the art lovers, and the great and good of the world come the families from all over the country and foreign tourists from all over the world. Everyone feels at home here in Versailles. In fact, when the Secretary of State for Fine Arts, André Cornu, made a radio appeal in February 1952 to save the estate, donations poured in from everywhere and everyone from wealthy patrons to the humblest citizens. 
Now the palace truly belongs to the whole nation. Hurry up, Chantal. We need to be ready to perform at 9 o'clock. Very funny. You think it's easy running in a corset? Oh, boo-hoo. The actual dresses at the time were even worse. Oh, Oh, that's a great memory that just passed by. It was the summer of 1953, and the great Sacha Guitry had set up his cameras at the palace to tell its story in a film that would really make a mark. Royal Affairs in Versailles. Let's follow those extras if you want. This is the biggest film shoot to take place at the palace since the end of the war. It's certainly a main act in the history of the relationship, which continues to this day, between the Palace of Versailles and cinema. All right, everybody, quiet on set, please. Ugh, there's no need to rush me, Sylvie. We have an hour to wait now. Oh, I have to say, being paid to wait around watching Claudette Colbert and Micheline Prell at work sits me just fine. <laughs> You know who's playing Louis XV? Jean Marais. I'm warning you girls, if I happen to run into him, I'll faint. But he looks nothing like Louis XV. Oh, Chantal, you're studying history at the Sorbonne, not cinema. That much is obvious. It's not just that. It seems that the script is littered with mistakes and anachronisms. It's a story, my dear. A pretty tale to inspire the French people. And pay for the restoration of the palace. Apparently, Monsieur Guitry is going to give a share of the box office receipts to the National Committee to save Versailles. He even signed a contract with the state. You see, it's worth a few historical inaccuracies. Just tell yourself you're working for a higher cause, Chantal, like Bourville, Gerard Philippe, and Tina Rossi. I was there when they filmed his song on the gondola. He was really singing along with the recording. It was so funny. <laughs> Giving us Edith Piaf singing Ah ça ira while hanging off the palace gates won't make us forget Guitry's stance during the war. Oh, Chantal, you see the bad in everything. We're still entitled to enjoy ourselves, you know? Well, she's not completely wrong, though. Oh, cheer up, ladies. Let's look at this film like a big party to unite the French people and repair the ceiling in the Hall of Mirrors. And in 20 years' time, we'll be proud to say we were there. Hey, I can say I was there, too. At each moment in the life of the palace and for each of the films shot thereafter, Royal Affairs at Versailles. The film was a huge success when it came out in 1954. I don't know whether it managed to unite the French people, but it certainly drew visitors to our door. And plenty of filmmakers who came to take advantage of the most beautiful surroundings in the world. Biased? Moi? As if. Roll camera. And action. After gamekeeping, carpentry, clockmaking, and art restoration, I could have learned loads of new trades just by watching the technical teams and the movie stars. Madame du Barry, Marie Antoinette, Five Day Lover, Marie Antoinette again, That Night in Varennes, The French Revolution, Valmont, Jefferson in Paris, Marie Antoinette yet again. The list goes on, right to this day in the 21st century and even beyond. Now, follow me to the final room in the gallery of the history of the palace. It's one we haven't visited together yet. Here, you can clearly see what Versailles has become. A temple of celebration, a space for artistic creation, and a venue for diplomacy. Just like in the Sun King's day then. But this time, everyone is invited. Just not during the visits of heads of state or international summits, of course, when you'd have to have the right credentials. Or be a ghost. Which is not an option open to everyone. Do you remember the visit of the ambassadors from Siam or Queen Victoria? Well, these lavish invitations continue to be issued to this day. I could list around 50 high-ranking guests since the end of the Second World War. Queen Elizabeth II, who came three times, John Fitzgerald and Jackie Kennedy, Nixon and then Carter, Khrushchev, Brezhnev, and then Gorbachev. Sounds like a song. And under the current French president, the future emperor of Japan, Naruhito, and King Charles III, it seems there are still a few crowned heads left after all. I love 
wandering completely unseen through these receptions. I'm no political expert. But you have to admit, there is a certain continuity between Louis XIV and the Fifth Republic, especially when it comes to hosting important figures. Take, for instance, June 1982, when President Mitterrand hosted the heads of state from the world's seven richest nations here in Versailles. They were here for three days of meetings, sure, but they also toured the state apartments, strolled in the park, slept at the Trianon, and enjoyed sumptuous meals. On the last evening, a closing dinner was held for them in the Hall of Mirrors, followed by a performance in the Royal Opera House, a concert in the chapel, and finally, a spectacular fireworks display and illuminated fountain show accompanied by the guards' trumpets. The Grand Master of Ceremonies of the King's household couldn't have done it better. Together, we have visited all the rooms of the Gallery of the History of the Palace, which means it's almost time for us to go our separate ways. If you have a few more minutes, however, retrace your steps as I'm doing now, and let's turn back time by heading to the very first room. It's interesting to go through history in the opposite direction. I still have another memory to share with you, and I found the perfect spot in which to do so. The room devoted to the estate of Versailles. Did you know that in the 18th century, the 800 hectares that made up what we now call the Estate of Versailles used to be referred to as the Small Park, as there was so much land beyond it? Come and see for yourself in the gallery in this video. It looks like a dragonfly's eye view of the estate. Ah, I'm being told in my earpiece that it's known as a drone flyover. Well, dragonfly or drone, this is exactly what I see when I fly above the gardens and the groves. It's magnificent, isn't it? All this nature around us, artfully tamed. But it's also fragile. In planetary terms, as well as here in our little Versailles universe. Almost a quarter of a century ago now, how time flies. In the final days of 1999, the storm that swept across northern Europe devastated our estate. I watched helplessly as crazy winds of 210 kilometers an hour knocked over 10,000 trees, often the tallest and therefore the oldest in the park. Afterwards, another 30,000 had to be removed. 40,000 trees and so many years of patient growth and care wiped out, just like that. But here again, life found a way. We have one more Kirkus rubber to plant, then we're done. How many trees would you say have been planted since the storm? 80,000 in 20 years? That's twice as many as were knocked down. Yeah, exactly. Careful, careful. Spread the roots a little more on this side. It's the first time Versailles has been rewooded since the 19th century. So, we should be grateful for the storm after all. Have you worked here since 99? No, but I've been told about it. I remember well the images on the TV and, and the wave of generosity that followed. Mary Antoinette's tulip trees, planted in 1783, became the symbol of the storm. Shall we fill in? Yeah. Today, the park is more beautiful than ever. Why is that? The destruction revealed that the trees were old. Plant life renews itself. And if you're going to replant, you might as well have a plan and do it right. <laughs> they went back to the beginning, didn't they? Yes, they did. They tried to restore certain parts of the garden to their former state. At the Trianon, they planted tree species they found listed in the 18th century inventories. So, the palace gardens look like they did during Louis XIV's time. Yeah, that's right. Oh, I'd have loved it had they replanted the maze, but it was not to be. <sighs> there you go. Grow tall, little loke. <laughs> and perhaps it will still be there in 400 years. 
Great. I'll go check on that oak when I do the podcast celebrating 800 years of the palace, which might be a broadcast on Mars. Replanting, restoring, redecorating to reflect modern tastes, then returning to the decor of previous eras. What if that's the genius of Versailles? Always evolving, beautifying itself, and remembering its roots, putting the past into the present, as Victor Hugo said. The aim of the Grand Versailles project of the 21st century reminds you of Louis XV's great project for his palace, doesn't it? So far, it has given us a fully restored chapel, a fabulous facade on the courtyard side, gleaming with a thousand gilded details, a reinstalled royal gate, and there is more to come. Ah, we're closing up. I hope you've managed to admire everything you wanted to see. If not, you'll have to come back. You're welcome any day except Monday. Because on Mondays, we're closed. But more importantly, on Mondays, it's madness! Don't think that just because we're closed to the public, the palace is empty and asleep. On the contrary, Mondays are when all the helping hands at Versailles get to work. When the vacuum cleaner and the feather duster become as important as works of art, the mirrors in the eponymous hall need dusting, as do the beds in the bedrooms. The horloger comes to set all the clocks to the right time, and a host of minor repairs are made. Then there are the school children, whose exclamations of wonder fill the calm and quiet air. Mondays are also filming days. Roll camera. Documentaries. Feature films and series only have one day to capture the palace on film. I love watching the actresses lifting up the hems of their crinolines to reveal trainers as they cross the courtyard. And the carriage hitched to fabulous Frisian horses just for that one day. Speaking of horses, did you know they're back here at Versailles? For 20 years now, the great stables have been alive with the neighing of the horses from Versailles National Equestrian Academy. Imagine my delight when I see the horsewomen riding their stallions along by the Grand Canal in the dawn mist. Thin gray swirls coming from the nostrils of Flamenco, Neptune, Septime, and the other horses. Suddenly, memories from my short life come flooding back. The hunts with Louis XIII in the woods and marshes. Where it all started. Next summer, the park will host the greatest ever of our time, the Olympic Games. The equestrian events, naturally, when there will be horses everywhere you look, even in sculptures and paintings, as our next exhibition will be on the connection between Versailles and the horse. I do hope you'll come. We can marvel together at these magnificent maned athletes performing dressage movements right where, 350 years previously, Louis XIV rode, all dressed up, on one of his unforgettable carousels. Long live the king! Versailles the Immortal. I told you so. Versailles Immortal, a fictional tale by the Palace of Versailles, written by Emmanuel Suarez and produced by Moustique Studio. Thanks to the scientific advice of Mathieu Davina, scientific director of the Palace of Versailles Research Center, featuring the voices of Anaïs Parello, Bruce Sherfield, Véronique Belloc, David Coburn, Elise Anderson Scotto, Yann Bean, and Tercelin Kirtley in the role of Pierre Duchamp. Discover 400 years of history as a gallery of the history of the Palace of Versailles, refurbished in 2023, thanks to the support of Région Île-de-France for the digital content. The Palace of Versailles podcast are available on all audio platforms in the Palace app and on en.chateauversailles.fr.